<clears throat> okay. So I'm going to show you two examples of network theory, um, network models and information theory. And there are sort of two different ways to do this. One of them I think is more traditional academic and the other one is more um, like analytics view. So let's quit Zoom here. Um, and so we'll look at like kind of both sides of what people do with these models. And let's do that. Oops. Oh, man. There we go. So today we're going to talk about network science as applied to cognitive science. So network science for a long time was, was thought of like literally as networks, like phone lines and internet lines and, you know, flight paths through the sky and all this kind of like interconnected nodes. And then cognitive scientists like myself were like, hey, that's a good idea. And so you see more of what's called network science applied to cognitive science. And so we'll do an example using some verbal fluency data that is available in this package. Now, MemNet, I think, has is still not in CRAN anymore. Let's look. MemNet. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure why they didn't update, but they have... Um, I posted a link a, a while ago on... E the announcement from Sean, I think, that says, hey, here's how you install it if yours is no longer working. Okay. So it's still available, um, but you have to kind of get it from the archive. Okay. And so we'll look at the, the verbal fluency data that's available in that package, and then we're going to turn off this notification thing. Thank you. And then we'll do a more traditional analytics example using NASA's NASA's metadata. And um, there's even more stuff you can do with the metadata, but this is also taken from the tidy textbook. And so cognitive science people like myself, the goal is to like think about how do we represent human processing, cognitive processing through the computer because obviously those are the first steps to AI and many other things that we can do. Like topic modeling is meant to represent this process where we are create these just, uh, just pictures of the data, right? And so I would say that a lot of folks in one way or another focus on modeling semantic memory. So we're building models and trying to predict what happens when people are pulling information to and from long-term memory and especially the, the dictionary memory. Right? Because that is so crucial to understanding what like language itself. And so I tell people, somebody today asked me what I do, and I'm like, I study the numbers of words. Like, I don't know how to put this, right? We, we study, I study like how to build models of memory. I'm like, oh, that's neat, but what do you do with it? I'm like, well, like you're talking to me, right? <laughs> like. You have to understand, like, how do people know what a word means and how do we decide what we're going to process back. So these, there are lots of ways to build these models. And so we did some already with LSA and topics. And now we're going to try network models, which aren't distributional models, but are very similar. So this is kind of leading up to WordNet. And WordNet really is a mishmash of a distributional and a network model. Um, and so we've thought about these traditional approaches with uh, the Collins Aquilian as hierarchical network of a bird as a dog. This is how WordNet is built. And then this idea of Collins and Loftus, these bubble models. And many of those are built in sort of a neural net system, which we'll do in a couple weeks. But you could easily use more of a, um, not go super complex. Neural nets are more complex. You could stay with just the bubble model, which would be a network model. Okay, we covered that. So network science provides us a set of tools to really take information out of the network once we build it. And the nodes in a network model, the bubbles, are whatever we're interested in, and that's usually a word. Right? And then what are called the edges are the relationships between those nodes. So they're the lines that connect one bubble to another. Often we're going to define this as some sort of similarity. 
because that makes a lot of sense. And the next week we'll talk more about similarity. But we could define this as a frequency count, how many times they occur together. Um, so a co-occurrence, a free association, which is also often considered a form of similarity. Um, <clears throat> we could look at um, brain fart. Uh, cosine distances. We could look at how many times they occurred in the same word window. We can calculate um, letter similarity, phonemic similarity, like how many sounds they share together. So there's lots of ways to think about this edge relationship. But it is some sort of number that represents the connection between those notes. And so there are many ways, that's what I'm trying to get at here, that we can meaningfully add a number to these values. And I have seen it done in a lot of ways, and I will point you to my um, esteemed colleague Cynthia, who uses a lot of this in her work, and so her paper's attached for this week, and we're going to use some of her pictures to explain this stuff, um, but she has done this in multiple ways, so thinking about um, uh, the connections between words, how many features they share is one I saw her do recently. And we can find that data, and um, if you're interested in building one of these for your final project, I have so much of this data, I will happily give it to you. So we can find data that helps us, that you know is the network we want to build. And so I can use words as nodes and edges as shared features, free association, cosine, correlation, um, Levenstein distance, there's lots of options. Oh. Man, I hate when it does this. Let's look at these pictures in a nicer format. Which one is that one? That one is uh, this one? Yeah. OK, it's a little bit bigger now. Um, an example of what one of these network models might look like. Right. So we have some sort of node, and we've centered here on the node for speech, but we could look at talk. And here are all the things that it is connected to. So the, the general picture when you draw these is you have if you're focusing on one words network, you put it in the middle, and you have all the words that are connected to it. Okay. Uh, this looks like it's actually, no, it's a one, what's called a one-hop network. So one-hop network is everything that's connected directly to this word in the middle. Okay. It's got speech to platform, politician, freedom, president. Here are political terms for speech, tone, debate. And then we've got speech, the actual like physical talking part of it. Uh, sermon's kind of an interesting one over here. I'm not normally put it over here, okay, but there isn't technically, I don't think there's any, um, you know, when they're fanned out like this, they're, they're not necessarily um, ordered in a particular way. Like these three are kind of together because they're connected to each other, but freedom here is uh, not connected to any of these other ones. So, you know, the way that it draws a picture isn't necessarily representative of space like we've been doing with factor analysis. Uh, boring, <laughs> class, words, okay. So in here is the more um, the academic version of speech. But all of this is the, the nodes here are the words and the connections are um, free association in this example. <clears throat> Now there's a couple of things I can do with that. So once I build it, I can start to play. Right? And that's the same thing we did with LSA and topics, is that we had to, like we built the model and then we started to do stuff. We could calculate this or calculate that. So with these, the, the, the nice thing about MinNet is it calculates these for you. And there's probably another package somewhere that does as well that I'll have to find that you know, is kept up to date. Um, but if you just do them by drawing pictures, you won't get these numbers. So the, the nice thing about uh, the network science stuff is that you can calculate you know, a measure of interrelatedness or get um, some statistics out of this. So the first thing we can do is calculate microscopic statistics. Okay? And these are focused on an individual node. So you would calculate these statistics by node. And you can do that with this package. I just I'm, I'm going to show you the like sort of global version of the micro statistics. Um, but they're generally used by node to represent kind of a measure of centrality. 
right? So how, how important is that node or how central is that node to the network? So we can calculate degree, this is often listed as K, and it's the number of edges. So it's the, the, the word itself and then how many things it's connected to. And nodes or words with more edges are more interconnected, and sometimes this is called their neighborhood. So it's you and all the people you know. So like social networking type models are a similar type of network model. They have kind of a different framework and probably slightly different math because um, I have not really done any of those, but it's the same idea of like, you know, you have this person who's connected to all of these people. And we're just doing that with the words. From that, we can calculate the shortest path between any two nodes. And this is sometimes called the hops. So when I say it's a one-hop network, that means everything that's directly connected. A two-hop network contains the first connection and the second connection. And so I can calculate how many hops it takes me to get from one word to another. And so this might be an American culture thing, but this is like six degrees of Kevin Bacon, <laughs> where you can get um, how many, you know, you take an actor and you see how many hops you have to take before you can get to a movie that Kevin Bacon was in. Um, and so the idea is that, you know, we can calculate how close words are. Words that are closer together are more similar. So let's look at this graphic. That's JSON. Let's look at the local cost of picture. So I high, um, so there's a definition on the slide too. Let's talk about local clustering. So C or local clustering denotes how much the neighbors are also neighbors. And so if you think about this with your friends, is how much your friend group also is friends right, with each other. Or is it like, I know this person and I know that person, but they don't know each other. So I high clustered word here on the left, everything is interconnected. So you see how there are all these extra lines. Now the, the, the left hand side, both sides here, but the left hand side here is showing phonemic connections. So they all start with the ba phoneme. Okay. Um, but, so you see budge here is not really interconnected in this network, but it has the DGE. Um, <clears throat> but this is a high cluster word. Okay. A low clustering coefficient or low cluster word, not, every, everything's not connected to everything else. So this one here is mostly connected through the L, L letter or phoneme or the og part. But hog is not connected to any of these other words. And this is a useful one, a uh, useful thing to know. And you can calculate it by word and then average those statistics over all the words. So highly interconnected networks where everything is connected to everything else have a high C coefficient. Okay. Um, if you get kind of a lower C coefficient, you can maybe find what are called, uh, find the local clusters. Some words are really interconnected and some words aren't. Um, and then you can think about globally, it's not super connected, but there's this one little section here where everybody knows everybody else. So you can kind of think about towns. I was talking to people earlier today about Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is interesting because the big cities are on either side of the state, right? Um, and the middle is mostly pretty rural. And so uh, what you see are these, like if you look at like a, um, a political map, you can see this pretty, pretty nicely. And I was like, you know, it's like, it's like the, middle, the middle of the state is like everybody knows your name and it's cheers. Right? Uh, so it's high clustering, but then they don't, nothing else outward. Right? So you get all these little small clustering coefficient, uh, high clusters in these little towns, but then globally, they're not really interconnected. All right, here. So those are microscopic views where you focus on one node at a time. A, a macroscopic view is when you talk about just the overall network. And so sometimes I, I love the way this is uh, denoted, uh, small world structure, um, but it reminds me of a, of a different project where people were calculating what might be considered edges, which is the small world of words, but small world structure 
is a network that has many high local clustering coefficients and many short path lengths. Okay. So, you know, how do we determine what many or what is high? Right. And so what, it, what, the, what mathematically happens underneath is it creates a random network okay. and compares the clustering coefficients to the short path length. So basically scrambles the network and the edges and says, okay, um, you know, if this network were actually random, is this clustering that's happening more than the random one? This is much like EFA's parallel analysis. Okay. And so things that have high clustering coefficients and short path lengths have a small world structure. So the larger the small world structure number, the larger, the more different it is from random. Um, and that idea, like, conceptually, is often related to efficiency. So things that are all very, very close together and closely related, you don't have to really go very far to transmit information. So if everybody lives in the same small town, you just tell one person a piece of news, and then an hour later everybody knows it. Right? This is the idea of gossip. And if you live in a really big town, you tell your neighbor, like, hey, this thing happened, it's not going to go anywhere. And so it's considered efficient in a network style because you only have to, you know, you push one thing out and it percolates to everywhere. Um, and so for cognitive processing, that's very efficient because um, that gets a lot of things activated at once. Okay. Now that's efficient, but sometimes it can cause like inter interference. Right? We have too many things going on at once. So then we'll get what's called atelectivity. Okay. Um, which is the correlation between the pairs of the node degrees, right? So if I look at word one, here are all of its connections. And then I look at word two, and here are all of its connections. Like how much do those two things match? If there's no overlap in word connections, this would be a little unusual, that would mean that every word is only related to any uh, one other word, basically, and that would be zero. There's no asortivity. As things start to intercluster and we get these higher local clustering coefficients, asortivity also goes up, where that implies that there are these like clusters that have occurred. And so, you know, if dog is related to cat and uh, I don't even know, <laughs> like that's how much my brain is working. Right, so we've got like a uh, dog is related to cat and to wolf and um, what's another similar animal? Uh, let's just go with mouse here. And then we have looking at um, a horse, it's related to, to ma uh, elephant. Ah, there we go, elephant. So it's related to mouse. It's a like joke that elephants are afraid of mice. And then it's also related to to um, elephants are wild animals, so lions and tigers, they overlap by one. Okay. Um, if they had no overlap, that would be zero. So let's try some of this. Oh, sorry. All right, so this is just me loading all the packages I'm going to use. And most of these packages are really just for this specific example. So JSON line here is because the, the second data set we're going to work with ha is a JSON data set. Um, but then the rest of these are mostly like graphing to make these graphs because the real beauty of network analysis is the graphs. So this verbal fluency data is this idea and it's tied to Alzheimer's and dementia is that we have um, an ability um, often tied to working memory of, of, of successfully retrieving information from memory. So what they do is they just say, you know what, tell me how many things, how many animals you can name in a minute. And you just start writing them down. Okay. Um, and that is actually one of the most common verbal fluency tasks around. Okay. Um, but you could also do other things like, how, like, you know, how many restaurants can you name? That sort of thing. Um, and you're just, often these are also used to study um, interference, where when bringing up one thing's name um, blocks you from remembering anything else, right? And this is when you get stuck, you're like, oh, the only thing I can think of is like this thing, and I can't get past it. That's called interference. And so a verbal fluency task, the larger the number, 
the more verbal fluency you have. And so the task in this data set is name all the animals you can think of in a minute. And it's kind of meant to represent kind of they start somewhere in the network, and that's pretty random for a lot of people. Um, it could be a high frequency uh, member of that network, or it could be low. So this um, sometimes is predicted by what's called loose modeling, like this idea that's you know, most of the time we get the high frequency member because it's the most probable, but sometimes you don't. So you start somewhere in the network, and then you're just viewing their path through the network. Because right? as you go from one to the other, they have to be connected, at least through animal in this example. And so we're viewing like, okay, the first hop from animal is cat. And the second hop from cat, or the second hop from animal, or the second, um, the one from cat is dog. And then, okay, dog, mouse, the mouse, rat. And like, you keep going. Right? <clears throat> and so we can look here at the data. This is part of the MemNet package. And I really do not love the way they structured this, but it is what it is. It's a list. The, the, the name of the list is the age of the participant. And then it's just literally all the words that they said in order. Now a key facet to the particular models we're going to build today, but not necessarily important for every model, is word or, uh, the order of the words. Uh, because what we're going to do is transform this into a uh, essentially a bigram frequency count. So how many times were chicken and cow together? Okay. And then how many times were chicken and cow like chicken and cow within the same five word window? Right. So once here, um, you know, chicken, rooster, donkey, horse, cow. Here's a five word window here twice. And so um, we're focusing here on frequency of co-occurrence, uh, and then changing what type of co-occurrence we're talking about. Are they directly next to each other within the same window? Are they within this set of parameters, et cetera? Okay. You could calculate the edges in all, uh, many other ways, but that's just the one we're going to do today. Okay. So I could, instead of having this, have a pre-calculated set of edges, and I tell it, here are the edge statistics. But this is even better because I don't have to know those already. I can take a raw data set. And so this kind of captures a moving window, which we have not been able to do with any of our LSA or topics models. Right? With bag of words models, you lose the effect of context, the things around it. Okay? Now, word net models don't, so that's where we're headed, <laughs> but a couple more weeks on that one. What are these NAs? These are when people said things like, um, like onion, like vegetables, so they're not part of the category. Um, but it leaves that structure of when it occurred in place. <clears throat> Alright, so uh, first thing I did was grab all the ages, just so I can build models of different types of people. Because models by themselves are cool, but let's compare different types of models. So I think these models would be really cool to do for I would say different presidential candidates, but right now, like, I just don't even know what you could do. You could do different Twitter accounts, right? Um, that might be really neat to just build a model of two different um, Twitter people and see what, what that looks like. Um, but essentially, they're, they're cooler when you can separate them out and have two of them and look at them. You don't have to, but, you, but it does make it more... Um, the numbers are more meaningful when you have a comparison point, is what I'm trying to say. So we're going to um, separate the data set into older, older adults and middle, older adults, because this data set is mostly older adults. Um, I think because it was mostly used as a, a concussion and or Alzheimer's screener. So you actually might get this test too if you get a concussion. Sometimes the test is called trails, and it has a bunch of different tasks, but this is one of them. So one of the types of graphs that you can make is a community graph. Okay. It adds the edges based on the number of words that occur within X number of words of each other. Okay. And so the default is one, and there are a couple of other co-occurrence rules, but the basic idea is like, as long as they occur within this window together. Okay. So they have to occur within at least one word of each other. Okay. And so that could be front or back. 
so it's a three word window. A threshold graph adds edges only for words that are adjacent. So these, these types of models can converge to be the same type of model, but generally they're, um, the other co-occurrence parts are, are, are small, these like small little rules that makes it what a community graph versus a threshold graph. But a threshold graph, the basic idea is that they are directly next to each other. Let me close Slack. I didn't realize I still have Slack open because otherwise my friends are going to start talking and it's just going to click for the next hour. Here we go. <clears throat> and then a random walk graph uses this idea of like these Monte Carlos, these kind of random walks. So unless I call them Metropolis algorithm, I think it kind of like pops around. Right? Um, and it adds edges for words that are within a window size of one. You can change that. And it has these kind of like random hops built into it to um, represent that memory is not necessarily a linear path where I can be, go from animal doo -doo 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 -doo, and then come back and be like, oh, let me go this other way. Um, so it kind of represents this idea that we're sampling from the network rather than um, assuming that this is a direct one to two to three to four. The age split here is totally arbitrary. I just like made it up so that I would have um, kind of an equal set of people in the graph. I, I, I think it'd be neater to, to um, find some way to do this in a continuous fashion, but I also think it's important to talk about the comparison. So we're gonna look at networks for people over 70 and then basically everybody else. And so here I just did, these are so easy, community graph for all these different text pieces. And then I just filtered it out. So anyone over 70, threshold graph and random walk graph. Super easy, that's why I like this package. Even though Cran doesn't like it. And then I did everybody actually less than 60. So let's look. So to build the plot itself, we take that um, saved memnet object okay. and we tell it edge to adjacent and make that plot okay. and so the plot the plotting function plots whatever's there this function is what creates the the, the edge statistics now this here is the size of the node and I think this is the size of the label um, so you can change these so they're a little bit more readable now, um, I will tell you ggGraph makes much cuter pictures than it will do in a minute, but not terrible. You can kind of look at the, the structure of the model, right? But the problem is the way it does the labels is like really unfortunate, these little dots, right? So like this is cult, okay. and then I got to figure out what's this one? Lion, directly connected, right? Which is then connected to tiger, that makes sense, which is connected to anteater. So this is kind of like zoo animals over here right we like farm animals um, and the, in this particular model the the words that are more interconnected are drawn together so like words that have um, a stronger connection or a larger edge get pulled in together so this would be a lo good local cluster right here okay. so the order I mean it's a bit arbitrary you could turn this graph but the words that are most connected are closer together. Right. And so we kind of kind of see the structure of I it was really like zoo animals and then like farm animals. Right. And we don't totally see like like dog and cat. The kitten and puppy are kind of over here weirdly in the zoo version. Okay. Compare that to the younger folks graph, so to speak. And we see that we got still some local clusters, but it's a little bit more spread out. And this one's a little bit more tightly pulled together. Now we can look at that again in the threshold graph. Zoom out just a little bit here. So the threshold graph um, produces a much tighter graph, but these are words that are directly adjacent. And so we're getting um, a lot of interconnection between words versus the younger graph, 
which shows less interconnection. So in general, this is not a ter this is a kind of common thing that we'll see as we age, we get more clustering because we have more life experiences. And then the random walk graphs, I personally think are a little hard to read because they tend to be a little bit bonkers. Um, but <clears throat> what we see is that since it kind of mimics this idea of random hops, um, we get more connectivity. So less words here because it dropped all the ones that weren't connected to each other. But with the random walk graph, you get more connections um, and maybe a lot more small connections. And so these graphs tend to be a little bit busier. But maybe a better representation. So um, what I'm not mentioning is some of these have minimum numbers of times that things have to occur before they get dropped. A random walk graph tends to take everything, like every little bitty connection. Whereas the other two graphs tend to be like, well, it's at least got to happen three times or it's not really consistent. And they drop them. All right, so older folks, let's look. Younger folks. Okay, this graph looks a lot similar. These two tend to match a little better. All right. So let's look at some network statistics and compare those between um, older and younger folks. So V is the number of nodes here. And this is our community graph. It's just the number of, of words that made it into the graph. E is the number of edges, so the number of connections. So even though it looked like there was more interconnection or more clustering in the older folks graph, the younger folks graph has more edges. K is the average clustering degree. So essentially, um, for each node, how many things is it connected to, right? Averaged over all the nodes. C is sort of an average clustering coefficient. Um, so how many um, things are connected to the same things across, you know, averaging across all nodes. And so visually, I would say that this looks like it had higher local clusters, but these are more clustered. But there's also more connections, so that clearly allows for more clustering. CC here, I don't totally get it. It's just a correction on the clustering coefficient, but it seems to be on a totally different scale. So I'm kind of ignore that one. L is our shortest path distance here. Those are pretty similar, honestly. Um, but lower clustering means longer paths. Small world structure here is S. So we're getting, we're actually getting more, sorry, interconnectedness. So the, remember, the larger S, the more um, interconnected things are. Uh, assortivity here is the same. There's actually kind of a negative correlation. So things that are connected to each other are connected to each other and nothing else. And then I don't even remember what P is. Okay. So we're going to leave that one alone. It's actually the same for each one. So that's why I said the numbers themselves are more interesting in comparison to each other. I mean, saying K is 2 is pretty easy. It means, uh, in, on average, most words are connected to at least two other things. right? But uh, in comparison, I think uh, when I look at the pictures, it sort of gives me this idea of like, OK, the older adults have these more like tightly focused clusters and the more edges visually and then the younger folks, but mathematically that's clearly not the way to have it. The other cool things you can do is focus on those individual words. And this is more useful, I think, if you're trying to, you know, think about keyword optimization or just like product reviews or any of that kind of stuff. And so I focused on cat. And so here's cat. And this is a uh, K here is a window size of three. And then all the rest of these things are, you know, the graph size. So cat here is directly connected to dog and squirrel. But then squirrel, if you look at the coloring here, is connected to uh, rat, rabbit, goat. That's raccoon, skunk and possums, oh, and also buffalo, which is a little weird. And then the third hop out here right, is the lightest color. So cat is indirectly connected to polar bear, who squirrel, 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 um, 
then rack squirrel, then raccoon, and then polar bear, I guess. Okay. Don't ask me how you go from raccoon to polar bear, but somebody did. And we can do that same thing for younger adults, and we see kind of the different um, structure of the words. And now this looks way more interconnected than earlier. And we can see the cat's more directly connected to more words. And so you're getting these um, larger hop networks. So the one hop network is larger, and then the second hop network is larger, and then the third hop is the biggest. Um, and so I think this picture gives me a better view of the fact that there's more interconnections for the younger folks. So maybe what we're seeing is dementia, which obviously causes you to lose those connections. Mm -hmm. Alright, so that's the more traditional network science version of this. Right? Um, <clears throat> and what would I do though if I was trying to, let's say I want to take all of my companies Facebook reviews and I just want to see what people are doing like it doesn't really matter to me um, if there's a small world cluster of these words right instead I just want to visualize like what are the most common things that people are saying together so almost like a cluster analysis so let's do that kind of style analysis on NASA's metadata okay so what is metadata Metadata is data about data, right? So it's information about what's in the data set. So instead of looking at NASA's raw data, what we're going to do is look at NASA's um, data about their data. So how it's collected, authors, variable names, uh, description. Sometimes this is called a code book. Okay? And so it just is the data about the data or a data dictionary. And so you know, this tells me a lot about what's going on. And I can convert this, uh, convert this style of analysis to any type of raw text data. And so I'm going to do a couple of things that are because it's, it's structured in a JSON file. And then, but honestly, any kind of text that you have, you can apply this structure to. All right, so what is JSON? Well, JSON is JavaScript Object Notation. I was trying to describe JSON to somebody the other day, and they're not like a, a data structure person. They're more of like, I can write code person. I was just like, oh, wait, do you know Python? And they're like, no. And I'm like, this is a perfect example in Python of, of, of a dictionary. Right, so you have these key value pairs. Let me make this picture a little bit. And so what we have are keys here, like ID, and these values that go with those keys. Okay, this one I've just kind of got to. So ID, zoom in, label, zoom in. Okay. So it's just a big set of key value pairs. Um, they're hierarchically structured so that you can have like uh, dictionaries and dictionaries. So here are all of the items. Okay. This itself is the menu. And um, it's a really popular machine-readable format for um, metadata. So if you ever are looking at Google's uh, data set search, they have a specific JSON format they want you to use. And the nice thing about it is that since it's structured, we can read it with our computer and a cool package in R uh, called JSON Lite, where you just say, hey, it's JSON, convert. Now it does convert it into this kind of wonky list, but well, we, we can work with that. And so what's in this data? Well, you know, they've got a bunch of stuff that, that they use, but we're really going to use these keywords, these titles, and then there's a description in here somewhere. One of these is description. I don't see where, to, where it's at at the moment. Oh, here it is, description. Okay. And so these are all things that they've used to kind of help people find different sections of what's in their data. So we're going to pull out this list of keywords. And since this is NASA, we're going to have things about Earth, the Jet Propulsion Lab, which is really famous for their, um, you know, the rockets and their cool pictures, um, the Space Center, so you'll see Johnson in there, and then the Goddard Flight Center, 
and then uh, just this national geospace data asset will come up a lot um, in our examples. So this is a list of keywords. Cool. I can handle a list of lists. I can also use the titles and the descriptions. <coughs> Excuse me. Now I could throw these all in together and just run this analysis on one big chunk of text. What we're actually going to do is build it uh, on each piece separately. And that's just to kind of show you a bunch of different things that you can do. All right, so I don't love tibbles, but I use them in this example just to show you some tidy, tidy, tidy text. <laughs> right, so tibble here, right? Well, we can do this in data frames. It doesn't have to be a tibble. Um, my big complaint about tibbles is the, their extra information causes other packages to go bleh. So, um, all right, so our ID here, our identifier, and that's just helpful to have a unique um, ID for each variable. And then we're going to throw in the titles. Okay, so here's our title data set. So we've got their ID and their titles. And we're not going to do anything on the IDs except to use them as um, IDs. Our descriptions here, so um, the, the IDs and the description. And then keywords. Now the keywords are tricky because we want to treat each keyword as a text piece. And so we don't really want to treat um, the keywords as just one big long string. We want to keep them together. So what we're going to do with the descriptions is treat them as a bag of words type model where we're going to lo look at like a community graph, one word next to another, that sort of thing. But with the keywords, we're going to keep them as whole objects. Okay. So this will be an ingram style analysis rather than a one gram style analysis. So the nodes become the entire keyword instead of single words um, that we'll do with the titles and the descriptions. So that to me is like the key, the, the distinction is that you don't have to use one grams, one word at a time as your notes. You can use entire phrases if you want. And the easy way to do that is to break it into a data frame that treats these keywords um, as each text piece separately. And so what we see here is the, the First identifier is repeated three times because there are three keywords. Now, unfortunately, that means that I have to keep them separate. Because if I merged them back together, which I could do because I have the ID, um, what would happen is these 24,000 objects would be repeated because the keywords, it has multiple keywords for each one. And then that would repeat the titles and the descriptions over and over again, which would cause us, um, which would inflate the statistics in our network, okay, which we don't need. So um, we're going to keep them separate. Now I could combine titles and descriptions. That might make the whole thing a little bit um, cleaner. But if you're going to have uh, something where we're keeping uh, multiple text pieces from each document, keep that separate from an analysis um, that has one text per document so that you don't accidentally create duplicates. Next thing, we're going to take out all the stop words. And this is just really common because those are going to really like cause you problems. In every other analysis we've done, we've talked about with uh, the models, <coughs> excuse me, these trees, man. <coughs> um, we've talked to like take out the stop words because then you just otherwise you have um, heavy network statistics that think that the N, A, and L are like the most important things in a model and they're super interconnected. Well, duh, because they're, they're words that are required for a sentence structure. Um, so we're going to take out all of our stop words and then uh, this will also drop that punctuation. Somewhere along the way we're going to drop punctuation because <laughs> We look, we didn't last time and you saw what happened. All right, so I'm gonna take my title and the cool thing about the tidy text package is it has this unnest tokens function that is like the one like is so glorious. That is a token, a word tokenizer, and it breaks apart the long description 
and essentially converts that, like melts it, if you want to go reshape or um, pivot longer, if you want to be the new version of Tidy. Um, what was the old one? Gather uh, function, where it takes a whole sentence, I am a dog, right? Um, and then converts that into one row per word. And so what you end up with is these, um, you know, the ID, because we got we got to have an ID for each one, which is important, and then each word one at a time. So where did the mouse go? Here we go. So the first description has this is a raw a data set edited raw dead earth. So those were the words in order minus the stop words. And then the anti join here takes out their list of stop words. And if you want to see what those are, you just type in stop words, and it'll print them out. Anti-join is like, I think, leftover from equal, <laughs> right? So there's left join, right join, inner join, outer join, anti-join, take them out, take them apart. Right. I'm going to do that same thing for the descriptions. Uh, so we've done this for the titles and the descriptions because they contain the stop words. Okay? The keywords don't. We want to leave those alone. Okay, so we're not going to break down the keywords because we're going to keep those as ingrams instead of one grams. So how many words do we have? This is cool, right? So now uh, once I break those down, I have about 200,000 words in the titles, and those are repeated, so that's not unique. And then about 2 million words, I think if I can count, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yeah, 2 million words in the descriptions, and I still have my 100,000 keywords. And this is why we did not join them together because otherwise it would make this part difficult. So, first question, what are the most popular words? Okay. And so we can use the count function, that's tidy's version of the table function. And if we look at the titles, the most popular words, okay, it didn't totally take out punctuation, I lied to you guys. Um, the most popular words are fave data, uh, two, version one, so they're using some sort of versioning, we should maybe take out the numbers. System, GES, um, disk, global. But phase, by far and large, is way more popular than the rest. Hey, okay, now I know there are 16,000 unique words. Let's look at the descriptions. 54,000 unique words out of the 2 million. And they're very similar. Data. Right. Um, this isn't surprising. This is a metadata set. <laughs> right. System, phase, space, NASA. Okay. Um, one thing I can notice, though, is all of these numbers. And so there, there appear to be some versions, like version 1, version 2, or just um, numbers for the missions. So maybe we should take those out. Maybe it's unclear what those numbers mean, right? I'll show you how to take them out in a second. Now we could also do this for keywords, and so this is, remember, an engram. And so we can tell that the number one keyword that they use is finished, <laughs> done, <laughs> stamped. Um, the National Geospace Dataset Asset, and check out this. This is going to be slightly problematic for us because every time they tagged it with the full label, they also tagged it with the abbreviation. And so you'll see this is going to create this little local cluster because they always occur together. There's another one that does this too. So you'll see in a minute. Earth Science, Active, the Space Center, um, Research Center, Langley, etc. Um, so NASA believes that, you know, taxpayer dollars, you paid for this, so you should see it. So they post mostly about their data. Uh, in that case, would I remove one form of it? Going back to your question here, yes, for this one, yeah. I didn't in this analysis to show you that, to show you this point. But um, especially when they come up as exactly the same count, and then you'll see in a little bit they're perfectly correlated, you might consider taking that out because that means they always co-occur together, which would be interesting if it wasn't clear that they did that on purpose. Right. So here it's just an abbreviation. That doesn't tell me anything interesting about the data. But if you know, you're looking at products and... Um, returned always appears with a product specific product name that's an interesting thing so kind of depends on what um, what's happening in this case I, yeah, I would take it out 
I didn't, but uh, you could. You could just filter it out. Uh, they also tend to use versioning, which I'll show you how to delete. And every, almost everything here is in lowercase, and I think one of these functions, the unnest function, might automatically lowercase. One of them, I think, does. Uh, but either way, always, uh, one text principle is to always lowercase, or always uppercase, or just make them all the same case. So that the same word as gets matched together. Unless you're trying to distinguish between Apple A Company and Apple Group. Alright, so here's an easy, now there are a couple of regular expression packages. Uh, string R and string I are really great, and they ha and there's a new one, ah, uh, brain fart, that's supposed to make like regular expressions like you talk, but I found that no matter what package I use or what um, I do, I have to Google them. <laughs> I just can't, like regular expressions just do not stick. Like there's like two I can do on my own, and I find it like very satisfying <laughs> when I can remember. And one of them is numbers. <laughs> so the grep function here, finds this pattern, okay, and, um, it, okay, so grep here, find this pattern here, and then zero to nine means find the number, and find it in the titles, and then we're going to drop anything, so this minus here says drop anything that has a number in this title, okay, so grep gives you, a, returns a list, or I'm sorry, a vector of numbers, I found in row one, this number, and then here's row two, and here's row three, and we're just going to drop all those ones that have numbers. And there are lots of ways to do this. I just really like base R's grep. Greppel is another one. Um, G sub if you want to substitute. So there's some base packages, or um, tidyverse has some packages too. So I drop the numbers, and I'm left with global space. You know, still got version. I can leave it in. And then two here, since they didn't do the number two, I'm stuck with this letter to I, I, but we'll leave it. It'll be fine. But I could do uh, or I, I as, a, as an option here, as a regular expression. So find a number or a single letter I or two letter I's together. Now the single letter I got eliminated in our stop words list, so that's why you don't see it. So sort of a weird interaction there. Now to me a more interesting question is starting to calculate the network statistics. Okay, everything we have done so far has been single word counts. And it's just interesting to look at. Right? And it also elucidates some problems that you may have to control for. Right? So some of these numbers or um, the, um, the versioning, that kind of stuff. But to build a network graph, we have to understand the relationship between nodes. And so the most common way to do that is to calculate collocates. So we're simply going to count how often they appear in the same one word window. I think it's threshold graph. Right? So just you know, row one to row two, and then row two to row three, and then three to four. Okay. Um, and that's really great with this pairwise count function in the tidy text package. And this is why I said you got to hold on to the ID because it's going to look at those words. Back up. To, I might have to go further than I think. Ah. Okay, so it's going to look at the words, and but only keep it within. Um, one more. Uh, Sorry, I think it was at the bottom of this one. Yes, sorry, I was trying to find the right one here. So it's going to look at the word column. Stop it. Thank you. Word column here and only keep it within the ID. So it's not going to cross different text um, identifiers. And that's important so that you don't uh, count the, the space between one text and another. So they are running up against each other because they're all crammed into one data frame, but it breaks it down by that ID. Here we go. Okay, so pairwise count words. So one to two is, you know, one, two to three, one, and then it counts. Counts, let's see how many times those occur together. 
Uh, sword equals true, upper equals false, so keep it in lowercase. And then you end up with this nice little table. So word one, word two, and frequency. Phase two. Okay. Uh, phase system, phase space, phase base. So phase is a common word that gets used a lot with other words. In the descriptions, we see data set, data system, data time. Okay, phase two again, data NASA, system NASA. So um, we're starting to see the like common pairs of words together. Okay. And we could do this more than pairwise. The pairwise count function has, I think, some options where you can do threes and fours, but the data set gets really large really fast, so we're going to stick with two right now. <clears throat> and then we can do the same thing with keywords, but now we're treating this as um, you know, pairwise keywords instead of pairwise words. And then here's the, the thing. Okay. So there's that, that um, perfect correlation. So what I would do is if I saw that they had a similar count, okay, and then here I see um, they're the most, like that's the same number as the count, and then in a minute, we'll see if they have a perfect correlation. I might just drop one of them. Uh, and then you see that same problem that they almost always list uh, earth science with it as well. It's not perfect, but pretty close. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> now the fun part. Let's make the graphs. And this, you have way more control over how all this looks. So for the title, the seed here just kind of controls the rotation. Um, so our title word pairs. The filter will depend on the data set that you have. The filter here is 250, just so that it doesn't graph too much. Uh, that number you'll change based on whatever data you're looking at. So this is not a standard number. We're going to graph from data frame okay, using the ggGraph. Um, and you can play around with all of this stuff. I just took this um, from the example because I'm not very good at ggGraph. I'm good at ggplot, but not graph. <laughs> and all of these are like, what color are the edges? How big are the edges? Well, it's based on the sample size. Um, how big are the points? How big are the labels? How close to the labels do you want the points? And then theme void here, delete this stupid gray background. And what we see are these little local clusters. Right? So we've got phase and all of its one hops. And so there's not a whole lot of intercorrelation between the words. It's pretty much always phase something. But down here, we see a lot of intercorrelation. So this would be a higher cluster coefficient where everything is related to everything else. And this one less so. This is a low clustered one. It's essentially just a one-hop network. The only one that's also uh, related is this path here. Let's look at now the descriptions. Now I up to this one to 250. I might have to go down a little bit because the graph is kind of not super interesting, but there's not a lot of interconnectedness. Most things here center around data because of what we picked. And then we get a little bit of this phase two problem again out here. And then now our keywords. Okay. Now, check it out. What do we got? These are all the centers, the different centers that NASA runs. So that's kind of a nice little cluster. Okay. And then we've got the most common things they're publishing. And here's that like super <laughs> duper connected, the three that always occur together. And it unintentionally makes this adorable little star, um, not on purpose. But the Earth Science Group, what are they printing? Earth, uh, oceans, atmosphere, biosphere, land surface, Earth Science stuff. It makes sense, the, the local cluster. And so that is creating the edges based on co-occurrence frequency. Let's instead now base the edges on correlation. So this is uh, a sort of me. It's how much the... If I pull out um, in, in GDA and all of the things it's related to, and then I pull out the National Geospace data set asset and all the things it's related to, we're now correlating how much those have the same um, data frame, basically. So if they always appear 
in the exact same places with the exact same things, you'll get a one, and then everything else is less. Um, and so, yeah, assertivity. And so here I've got it filtered by 50. It has to occur at least 50 times. And then our pairwise correlation. Um, so you can control this number too. Uh, pairwise correlation just compares every word to every other word. Key word here in this example. And so here's our, our perfectly correlated words. And it turns out there's another one that we didn't see that are perfectly correlated. So uh, AIMS and Dashlink, knowledge sharing, and schedule expedition, right? So there are a lot of things that are very highly correlated. They have the same, in, same network. And I can visualize, visualize, visualize those. Okay. And I changed that correlation to 0.6. So we get a little bit more stuff here. And notice that just some of the words have changed. Like instead of being based on in, it's based on correlation. That kind of thing. And so now I have an interesting network of some things I can understand. Some moons, um, some atmosphere stuff, imagery stuff, turbulence flow models, scheduling missions. We've got, this is more earth science stuff. Uh, here's our, our NASA. Dash link aims thing that we didn't realize was super correlated. Here we got some gravity. So you can start to see uh, if you if you were to like pull out the different groups of people that work at NASA, like you know like what are the different laboratories doing and the different like uh, research centers doing, you would find that there are you know there are people who are working on Earth science. And the people who are working on these flow compression models for air and water. And so you, you can almost see the structure of the institution without knowing hardly a whole lot about it. Okay. Except that it's NASA. Right? <clears throat> so the cool thing about these is like I don't even need a number to begin to interpret some of these things. Now I could calculate the, the clustering coefficients and K and all that stuff here, but I don't know that I need to. I can start to see, well, like that company has a group of people that are working on this kind of thing, and then atmospheres, and then flow, that kind of stuff. So what do we do? Well, that whole section is tidyverse, so um, creating these kind of bag of words-esque models um, using tidyverse, cleaning that stuff up, because I do think the tidy text package is one of the best, coolest things, that I'll, other than TM. TM is amazing as well. Um, so cool packages that language people can use. We started with a more traditional approach, and I've used that as my base for, um, like, I, like, what a lot of people do is build those models and then pull out the numbers and use those numbers to predict something else. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, Cynthia's article that's included talks about that, where it's like, okay, we built this model, and then we calculated all these Ks and shortest paths and clustering coefficients, and then used that as a predictive variable. Um, and then the more traditional analytics approach about just creating these visualizations. And that can be combined with the topics kind of modeling to help show the data. So we've at this point now covered three different ways that you can take a bunch of text and just show it. Right? We're not really trying to predict anything and we're not really trying to, um, you mean maybe you're predicting group or creating um, uh, most probable topics or whatever, but in general, though these kinds of models are really good at just like, here's what's there. Now take that and go do something else, clustering, log, whatever. 